All right, I want to welcome you to the class tonight. We're going to start in Galatians chapter 1. And if you will, read with me from verse 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you in peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men, or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we began a, a, a study a couple of classes ago about the Pauline epistles and about the about the, the actual writing of them. And uh, so we're going to continue along in that study tonight. And I'm beginning tonight in Galatians chapter 1. Uh, the, in our last class, we talked about the writing of First and Second Thessalonians, which almost certainly were the first two that, that Paul wrote, and about some significant things about the Thessalonian epistles. And so now we've come to the Galatian epistle, which is... I believe, the next epistle that he wrote. And the reason I'm beginning here in this passage is that one of the principal things in, in identifying when, it, when the likely time was of him writing the letter is that it appears that Paul uh, visited, went to Galatia, preached there, later on returned for a second time before he wrote the letter. In other words, he, and, and so here he says, the, he, he says it like in verse 6, he says he marveled that, he said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Apparently something that he saw for himself, not something that someone uh, told him about, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that in, in that letter, he refers to uh, having heard some things about the assembly. But this indicates this is something that he saw for himself. That is, he, he had been there, preached to them, came back later, and things were not the same as they were before. Uh, notice in chapter 3. In Galatians 3, uh, from verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians! Who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. And, and this is probably something that's significant that he mentions the working of miracles. And, you know, in all of this, there's sort of a thing in the background that apparently, after he had come and preached to them, by the time he comes the second time, some, uh, some men had come and bewitched them had caused them to turn away from the, the basic truth that Christ justified us from all things, from, from the Galatians. He justified them from all things they could not be justified by the law, causing them to believe they had to be circumcised and do this and do that, or they weren't going to be saved. 
And so it indicates that some these men had uh, caused the people to question Paul's authority. And I believe that's why he makes the point in the beginning there about, I, I didn't, I didn't, the gospel that was preached to me is not after man. I didn't receive it from men, uh, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. And he refers here to who's bewitched you? Who, uh, he that worketh miracles among you. At that time in Paul's ministry, he worked miracles. Uh, spoke with other languages because at this time the Jew is not yet cast away. He's going into the synagogues and unless he has these signs, the people are not going to believe that he's from God. And so he, he confirms the fact that he had these signs. He, had, I, I, he worked miracles among them. Uh, look at chapter 4. In Galatians 4, verse 9, he says, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. You have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you at the first. See, it indicates he had been there, preached to them, now he's been again, and things weren't the same. Verse 14, And my temptation which was in my flesh you despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness she spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I'm present with you. So I've gone to, it talked about these things here in, the, in this Galatian epistle because I want you to see that the, this, this indication that he preached to them, later on he comes back and things have changed. There's, there, there's been, someone has come and caused them to uh, doubt his authority and bewitch them and turn them away from the truth. Now, I want you to go to the book of Acts and let's kind of go, maybe go back uh, a little bit, maybe re review just a couple of things from our last class. And I realize this is not like, a, you know, I guess an ordinary kind of Bible study when we talk about things this way. This is not so much about, uh, about preaching, but, uh, and some people might find these things boring. But uh, I know that, uh, that there are some who, uh, you know, that, that would that, that benefit from this type of Bible study. So I hope you will too. In Acts 15, we're going to read here in verse, we're going to begin from verse 36. And let me mention to you before I read here that, uh, and maybe I'll just go ahead and put one of my, my poor maps on the board. This, I'm going to let that be uh, the peninsula where we find uh, Macedonia and Achaia, which is Greece. And this is the Aegean Sea, I believe, that they call it. This would be what's present-day Turkey. It's called, for the most part, Asia Minor in the Scripture. And then, of course, we come down. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Jerusalem is down about right there, you know. Uh, Antioch, which is more or less Paul's headquarters for all his missionary journeys, is here. And there's an island down here which is Cyprus. As a matter of fact, I believe I might have misidentified. I'm not exactly sure. I believe I might have referred to it as Crete in my last class. And if I did that, I apologize. It's Cyprus. Crete is actually uh, over here. It's also an island. Now, when Paul made his first missionary journey, he left out with Barnabas and uh, John Mark. And they came down here to Cyprus and came across the island and then kind of went up like this. And he got up to a place where he was stoned. Scripture says he was stoned and left for dead. And most likely that was when he was caught up and received 
a lot more revelation, but he was not free to tell it at that time. And he talks about the Lord having given him a thorn in the flesh, lest he should uh, be exalted above measure. It wasn't time uh, for him to reveal all of those things. But So he, this is his first journey. And so they begin to backtrack from there. They come back here, and instead of going back through Cyprus, they returned by sea over here to Antioch. So that completed that first missionary journey, and he didn't ride anything during that time. Now, where we're going to begin in Acts 15 from verse 36, th this journey has been complete, and he determines that something he wants to do. So in Acts 15 verse 36, he says, And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord, and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. And of course, one of the fascinating here about how that Barnabas, so this leaves the picture entirely, he's never heard from again. It's like Barnabas had done for Paul what he was going to contribute, and so the Lord removes him from the picture. Silas comes in, and so I guess I'll do like they do in the study books, and I'll use a different color. So this second journey, he says, let's see how they do, where we preach the word of the Lord. And instead of coming by the sea, they come by the land and kind of backtrack over this way in some of these places where they had already been. And you notice he said, confirming the churches. Now from that point, they, he veers off. And so come to, down in chapter 16, Acts 16, verse 6. He says, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they decided to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now I want to mention that Apparently, the, the, that the region of, that's called Galatia is more or less this center region in here. And it, you know, it's not, a, it's not really one city. It's a, a region. It's a, if you, in Galatians chapter 1, the letter is written to the churches of Galatia. So it indicates that once he had gone past those places where he had already been confirming the churches, that he took off this way and preached the word up in that area which is where the, fir the first time we find him making a reference to Phrygia and Galatia. So I believe this is the first time he goes there, you see. Preaches there. And it's like that he, he wants to go this way. Uh, he refers, what, to the uh, Bithynia? It will be like going up toward, almost like to go toward Russia. And of course there's the, the Black Sea, I, I, I think it's, something, it's like there. But anyway, rather than that, the, the Lord directs him uh, over this other direction, and the city which he refers to, Troas, is about right there. So after he goes through this territory, he kind of wanders about a little bit, and he finds himself right back down here, and he sees this vision. Now, and of course, we, we went over some of these things in the last class where he, he goes by water to Philippi. Philippi is up there and then uh, the city of Thessalonica, and he comes on down later to Berea, and, you know, he, he makes his way on down the, the uh, peninsula there. Now, come over to chapter 18. Acts 18. In fact, uh, let's see, he leaves from Berea and comes to Athens, which is about right there, and then he makes it to Corinth, which is uh, where we're going to we're find him right here. Um, and in Acts 18, 
Well, let's see here from verse 9. He says, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And so in our last class, we saw that it was during that year and six months that he wrote the first and second Thessalonian letters from Corinth. Uh, and it, we saw how that everywhere he went along through here, he's being persecuted. I mean, it was like uh, he, he was jailed up there in Philippi for casting a demon out of a, a woman. Comes down to Thessalonica, and it's like the whole city just exploded on him. And he winds up in Berea, and it's, it was like this for him. He preached down there in Athens. And, and so we got to, to Corinth here. Now where he wrote First and Second Thessalonians. Now, I want you to come down to verse in Acts uh, 18 here. Come down to verse 22. Acts 18, verse 22. He says, And, and when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. Now, this is very subtle in the Scripture, and uh, maybe I'll do it like this. So this is how that, this is how that journey went. Now, he, so from Corinth, he goes back to Jerusalem. And as he lands, it says Caesarea is on the seacoast. He, he comes to Jerusalem, which is a very significant thing there, but we're not really t <laughs> dealing with that aspect of it. So, and he comes back to Antioch. So that would be the conclusion of his second journey. These things are fascinating to me. He makes three missionary journeys. He makes the first one and doesn't write a thing. He's stoned and he sees a lot. <laughs> but he doesn't write anything. He makes the second journey and it gets a lot of uh, churches established but only writes First and Second Thessalonians. Of course, he, this is where he sees the Lord in a trance and the Lord, where the Lord sent him not to baptize and so forth there at the end of that second journey. Then he comes back to Antioch. Now, that can, see, that concludes that second one. So the thing that's so interesting here about these two little verses, verse 22 is the conclusion of his second journey. Let me read Acts 18, verse 22 again. It says, and when he had landed at Caesarea, which is on the seacoast, and gone up, that means going up to Jerusalem, and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And don't worry about the north and south and up and down, because when you leave Jerusalem, you go down, whether you're going north, south, east, or west. If you go to Jerusalem, you go up. That's just the way it is in the Bible. Uh, whether it has to do with it being elevated or I really couldn't answer that exactly. I just know that in the Bible, when you go to Jerusalem, you go up. And when you leave there, you go down. In fact, sometimes it says you descend. When he had descended from Jerusalem, they ascended up to Jerusalem. It's fascinating how that is. So after he'd been there, so he concludes the second one and he begins the third one. And this is how it begins, verse 23. And after he had spent some time there... Antioch, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So now we've, got a, his, we've identified it, his second time there. And the fact that it says that he strengthened the disciples, furthermore, you know, that indicates he had, he had already been there once to establish them, and now he's there to strengthen them. And I believe that it is at this point point that he learned of all that had happened there, what was going on, and of the necessity then to, to write to them. So uh, come over to chapter 19. In Acts 19, it says in verse, verse 1, Acts 19, verse 1. 
He says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and find, finding certain disciples and so forth. So in other words, then that third journey, and I, let me see, I've got to put another mark up here. Ephesus is kind of like right there. So when he came back this third time then, he comes back this way, and apparently then these churches that were in Galatia, he said he strengthened them, and he winds up coming back there to Ephesus. Come down to verse 8. Acts 19, verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened, and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. I see, I believe there's that reference again to the miracles that he was doing at that time. And so I, I believe that it was during this he, he refers to two years in verse 10 and, and there's the three months that are referred to in verse 8. So then I believe it's, this would have been the next opportunity that Paul would have had time to have the, you know, the freedom and the liberty to write again. So that the Galatian epistle then, you see, I believe would have been written right at that point. He, he's, he's been there twice. He's seen what's happened. He, he has the time now to write, and so he writes, you know, back where he'd been, back to them from Ephesus, so that we have that then being the third of his epistles. And, you know, there's something else I might want to just remind you about. Uh, one of the things that we're looking to in all of this, uh, as far as Paul's manner is, from the very beginning, his manner is to go into the synagogues in each of these places. In the synagogues are Jews, Jewish-born people, and Gentile people who believe in their God, who believe in blessing uh, Israel. They believe in helping them. They, be they believe that they're going to be blessed for blessing them, just like God told Abraham, Abraham, I'll bless them that bless you. I'll curse him that curseth you. So in other words, they, they believe in, and they have an association then with Israel. Paul is not going to these cities and setting up on the sidewalk and preaching to just everybody that walks by, telling them that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again. That is not what he's doing. He doesn't have the liberty to do that. He doesn't have the, the, he's not free to do things that way yet, even though I believe as a result of that that he learned when he was called up, he knew someday the gospel would go out to all men even to us. But he couldn't tell that yet because it was necessary for him to preach to those Jews first. Therefore, he said in Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. To the Jew first. And he meant what he said. And also to the Greek. That is that Gentile who was there. But if you were not there in the synagogue, you would not, he would not have preached anything to you other than the kind of preaching he did in Acts 17, which was he just refers to God as being the creator, made of one blood, all nations of men. He's going to judge them all someday, he said. He's risen a man, raised a man from the dead, and he's the one that's going to judge you. I mean, check it out. He doesn't tell those people that Christ died for them yet. So he's going into these synagogues and preaching in those synagogues that God has declared Jesus of Nazareth to be his son by raising him from the dead. And the fact that God raised him from the dead is the proof that he's the Christ, the Messiah of Israel, the heir of all things. That's what he's preaching in the synagogue. Now those people that hear that and believe it, he separates them like it says here, either next door to a house or a school or wherever, and when he gets those people aside, then he shows them by the Old Testament scriptures how that Christ, the Christ they already believed in 
had died for their sins, had justified them from the, all of the things of the law that uh, began to show them that hope they had in the rapture and on and on. But he did not tell those people any of those things until after they believed in the resurrection. And so it's so fascinating as he's going, carrying this ministry out, because in each place where those people reject the resurrection, it's like they're, they're cut off. They're cut off from Israel. That's where the, you know, the breaking of the branches of the olive tree, <laughs> it's, it's that kind of thing. But you see the people then who do believe and, and all of these places where he's setting up the, and teaching them in the schools and so forth. That's the church. That's the body of Christ in each of these places. They, they, start, out, or not, uh, they start out with people that came out of the synagogue, Jews and Gentiles that believed uh, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, it's fascinating here where he's uh, at Ephesus and... Um, I'm sorry, I, this is not exactly right. I, I, this, this was like this, that he had actually come to Ephesus before. That's the way it was. At the, at the end of his second journey. So this is the second time he's come to Ephesus, but he didn't stay there very long at all. Now he's come and he's, he's spending some time there. Now, come down with me to verse 21 at the end of this period of time there in, in Ephesus. By the way, this, uh, anybody have a question at this point? You know. Okay, Acts 19, verse 21. He says, After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a season. And the same time there arose no small stir about that way. And of course it's while he's in Ephesus that all of these, these Diana worshipers got stirred up. But that's for, what I'm interested in right here. Uh, notice in, that again in verse 21. What he's saying there. He's telling about, he's got a plan. Uh, this territory here is what is called Macedonia. When you, Philippi, Thessalonica are referred to as cities of Macedonia. When you get down to this part, which is Greece today, that's where he calls it, I uh, uh, might not, not spell that right, Achaia. So what he's, he's, while he's in Ephesus, he's got in mind to come up, and he does, comes up into Macedonia and to come down again into Achaia. That's, he's revealing his, his purpose, but ultimately he said he's going to go unto Jerusalem, right? So that's his, that's his plan. But while he's there, he does something. Verse 22 says, so he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a season. Ephesus is referred to as the city of Asia. Now, this bears upon the writing of the next epistle. Uh, look in 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 16. In First Corinthians 16, follow me along there with, in, from verse 1. First Corinthians 16 verse 1. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Now that's very an interesting point there, and I, I, that again indicates to me that the Galatian letter was written before 1 Corinthians, because it indicates that whoever 
Not that he wrote the Galatians pertaining to the collection for the saints, but whoever carried the letter to them carried also the instructions to take up an offering. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but as Paul is doing, carrying out this ministry up here, primarily to the Gentiles, he had made an agreement with the twelve to remember the poor when he revealed to them that gospel that he was preaching among the Gentiles, and it was a different gospel. James, Cephas, Peter, and John shook hands with Paul and Barnabas at that time recognizing that Paul had a, the grace to go to the Gentiles. He said, they said, Paul, you preach to the heathen, we'll preach to the circumcision. And they recognized Paul's distinctive ministry at that time, but they also made an agreement that they would remember the poor. That is, these poor saints at Jerusalem who had sold out all that they had. And bear in mind, that's what the Lord told them to do. Sell that you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old. And when Acts 2 rolls around, they did exactly that when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. All those people that believed, it says that they, everyone that had houses or land sold them and they divided it according to every man had need. These people had sold out believing that Christ was going to come back in their lifetime and they found out from Paul that he weren't. Oh, what are they going to do? <laughs> God had made provision because He was going to supply their need through these Gentile people. And Paul wrote in the book of Romans that because they had been partakers of their spiritual things, they would be partakers of their carnal things. So these Paul takes up collections up here that he was going to take. And so anyway, from Ephesus then, he wrote the... He said that he had sent a letter there, given order for the collection... Okay? Verse 2, Galatians, uh, first, first Corinthians 16, verse 2. He said, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, and it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. When we saw there in, in Acts 19, he said that he purposed in the Spirit that after he had gone through Macedonia and Achaia, that he was going to go to Jerusalem. Here he's talking about riding to the Corinthians telling them, I'm coming, I'm planning to come that way now. Get up your offering, because I've already told them, get up your offering. And he said that while he was there, he sent unto them Timotheus, and he says, writes to him, he says, now when Timotheus is coming. So in other words, we can identify then, not only was it at Ephesus where he wrote the Galatian letter, that's where he wrote 1 Corinthians. I mean, if there's anything that needs to be... How can it be any plainer than verse 8? But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. I mean, it's obvious, but he had been there once before. And if we, we could take the time, there's show that it's very unlikely that he wrote during the first time. As I said, he hadn't been there very... In fact, if you want to look at that, let, we'll just take a minute and look at that. While, you're, while you got 1 Corinthians 16, there's some people that he mentions... Look at verse 19. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19. He says, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Then as he's writing from Ephesus here, <laughs> Priscilla and Aquila are there, aren't they? He's, he's writing the letter to them. Okay? 
he says, hey, Priscilla and Aquila salute you. They, mean, they say, hey. <laughs> and they've got a church in their house. Go back to Acts <laughs> and look at chapter 18. We're going backwards here, of course, to that second journey, the second missionary journey. And in Acts 18, uh, verse 18, he says, and, and Paul, after this, tarried there uh, yet a good while. He's talking about Corinth the first time he was there. And then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. Priscilla and Aquila, he left them in Ephesus. They, that's the first time they come there. They, they came with him from Corinth. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry a longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And of course, then he did. And he sailed from Ephesus. So even though he had been to Ephesus uh, at the end of our, it'd be our blue line there, at the end of that second journey, toward the end of it, he'd been there once. And he took Priscilla and Aquila and left them there. Didn't sound like they had time to get a church started in their house, did they? Didn't sound like he had any time to write nobody. He said, well, they wanted him to stay. But he said, no, I can't stay now. I've got to go to Jerusalem, but I'll come back if God will. And so he did. And then when he comes back, Priscilla and Aquila have had time to get a church started in their house. Am I making any sense? Like I said, I realize these things are they're not you know, your, your typical kind of Bible class material. But it's Bible. So he... <laughs> It, we can show then he very unlikely, he, even though it's obvious he wrote 1 Corinthians from Ephesus, he said, I'll tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, but it's unlikely it would have been that earlier journey, it would have been the next one when Priscilla and Aquila would have had time to get a church started in their house, when he had time to write. He said he was there for two years and three months altogether. So, we've got so we got some pretty good evidence going here then about some things. We've got the fact that uh, first and first Thessalonians, second Thessalonians, first of epistles written that were written from Corinth during that second journey. Uh, then the, he's the third journey, he writes Galatians and first Corinthians from Ephesus. Now, Rather than to go into the next two epistles, which will be 2 Corinthians and Romans, which we'll see, as we talked about in, in the class, uh, previous class, maybe I'll do it like this. There's, and I'll, I'll, just for the sake of my chart, I'll come bring these over here. We've got these epistles. And of course, there's some teachers that do these, a little, they, you know, put it in other places, but that's all right. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Romans. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 epistles that Paul wrote while he's at liberty to go into the synagogues, preach the resurrection in there, the gospel of Christ. Those people that believe, he separates them. Then he shows them how that Christ died for their sins, gets the churches established. Those people that reject the, the resurrection, they're out of the picture. So all of these written while he's at liberty. And these are fairly, as we say, we have some, you know, considerable evidence as to where he was and when he wrote them. But then later on, I'll tell you what I'll do right now since we're in the book of Acts. He lets something be known in chapter 22. Come over to Acts 22 just for a second.
In Acts 22, from verse 17... In Acts 22, verse 17, he says, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. I believe he's referring to something that happened right there at the, at the end of that second missionary journey like we were talking about just now. Verse 17 again, It came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles." And they, the Jews that were listening to him there that day, and they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging, that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. And from this point here then, Paul is bound. He becomes a prisoner basically at this point for his own good. But he, bec he becomes a prisoner for letting it be known that that truth that he had been preaching to those people who had believed in the resurrection, that Christ had died for their sins and justified them from all things, that now he's going to take that message far hence unto the Gentiles. Those who hated Israel, never had any association with Israel, the, no matter what their background was, no matter what their sins were, no matter what idols they had worshipped, that they were going to have the opportunity to hear that Christ had died for them also, that God was ready to save them by their faith instantly if they would just trust Him. He's making known the fact that God is going to be gracious unto all men, as it says in Titus, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. And from that point he becomes a prisoner, and he refers in Ephesians 3 that he became a prisoner of Christ for you Gentiles. Not the Gentiles, you Gentiles. He had already been preaching to some Gentile people that had a, an association with Israel. Now he's going to preach to them whether they have one or not. And so from that point, after he becomes a prisoner, he writes the other epistles, and uh, I may not lay them out in the exact you know, order right here at this, at this moment, but he writes uh, Philippians, uh, Titus, the Colossian letter, the Ephesian letter, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and of course I believe Philemon's probably up here somewhere, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, so that the 6 plus 7 is the 13, <laughs> 13 epistles, 13 represents rebellion, but God's grace to rebels today. And the fact that this 7 here fills it up. And the number 7 is a number of completion in the Scripture. And so Paul, in the, after becoming a prisoner, filled up the Word of God for you Gentiles. He fulfilled, he, it's complete now, and, because, and without what's revealed in here, you couldn't prove that you're saved today nor could you get somebody off your back that was trying to put you under some kind of denominational bondage by their ordinances and their so-called commandments. What they think you ought to do and how they think you ought to live. And it's so amazing. I was mentioning this in the last class. All this time that Paul was free. There's something that said, turn back the page at chapter 20, Acts 20. In Acts 20, this is, this is at the end of that thir third journey. And he does is exactly as he said here. I've, I'm all lost track of my, which color is what. But the green, of course, is after he writes the, the Galatians and 1 Corinthian letter. Then he, he does travel back up this way. He comes right back to Corinth. And he returns, not all the way to Ephesus, but he comes to a city that's on the coast there. And he calls them to come to him. Okay? Before he's going to go back. Uh, and when he knows when he gets down there, it's going to be bad. 
Let me, I'll read from verse 17. Acts 20, verse 17. He says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Miletus, he was that sea on the coast. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. See, that's the way his ministry went at the first. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He knows when he leaves from here, he's going to make that thing known that we just read. It has to do with the gospel of the grace of God. And he knows that when he does it, it he knows that he's going to be bound. But did you notice he says, I go bound in the Spirit. All this time that he was free, physically, he was bound in his Spirit because there were things that he knew that he couldn't reveal. And it's coming to the time for it to be revealed. So when he gets to Jerusalem, he makes it known, and he becomes bound physically. But I bet you he weren't bound in the Spirit no more. And I don't know if, I, if I'm making any sense about that, but I mean, do, do you have any idea? Have you ever, ever been in a situation in your life where there's something that you knew, and you wished you could tell it? I mean, in a way, though, you, you realize that you, you wanted to tell it because you wanted to get, you know, somebody to brag about you, which is why God gave him that thorn in the flesh, lest he should be exalted. God had revealed to him that, God, the, that, that the Lord was going to save people like us. And he wanted, to, he wanted to tell that, not just for their sake, but for his own, don't you see? I mean... The Lord showed me this. <laughs> I mean, there ain't a soul of us here that doesn't feel that way about certain things. And bless God, that's the, it's for preachers and teachers, that's one of the worst things that they have to fight. It's the Lord showing them something and they want to crow about what God showed them instead of taking the thing that God showed them and serving the people with what God showed him. And there's the fellas that want that so bad, they see things that ain't there. Because they want the credit for seeing something, but it ain't even there. <laughs> but Paul wanted to tell it, but he, he couldn't, and he was bound in his spirit, even though he was free to go about. But when he went to Jerusalem and made it known, they bound him up, but he was free at last to let, it, let the cat out of the bag, let the chips fall where they may, let that truth be known that glorious gospel that he said, and he talked about it over. He says, you know, when he wrote Timothy, in 2 Timothy, he told him to consider what I say. The Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, is raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble. As an evildoer, even unto bonds, he said, but the word of God is not bound. He said, therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake. It's like he recognized if it was for the gospel's benefit that he be bound, he was ready to have it. It was it was because he knew. He said that they may all that the elect that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. But you know what? That brought Paul suffering because a lot of these people you know, that he had preached to during his, while he was free to go. These Jews and Gentiles that blessed God. When they heard that people like you were going to be saved, that God was going to send Paul to people like you, they didn't like that. They didn't want them in their assemblies unless they cleaned up their act. And uh, 
And they brought persecution upon Paul. And you know something? I don't care how you slice it. If you try to make this distinction known, you're going to, you're going to face persecution from the religious of this world. And in some cases, from the dear, beloved Bereans and grace believers, so-called. The fact that there is a division in Paul's ministry and the things that he revealed in these epistles is where you come in. Now the gospel of, of Christ is preached to these people back here. These people are saved by the grace of God. There is a, the body of Christ is there, but they did not want them to be involved. And so when he wrote the Ephesian letter in particular, he talked about that whatever things were between them had been nailed to the cross and that he had made both one unity. Because see, these people back here, well, they observed the Lord's Supper. They had been under the law. In fact, Paul gave them certain ordinances to keep that were ordained from the church at Jerusalem and baptized many of them. But when he met, made the truth known that the gospel was going to them, whatever ordinances there were, were nailed to the cross. So you know something? He said, Unity. He said that we're to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And that's the truth that makes the unity. That's exposing that thing, that whatever divides people in the flesh was nailed to the cross. Well, the last thing, time's about up. Look at Ephesians 2. And when he wrote these folks who, of course, were saved after Paul became a prisoner, and he writes to them, and he says in verse 11, Wherefore remember, and I might remind us, you know, we should remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, like the time of his ministry in the book of Acts, ye were without Christ. Well, Paul, why were they without Christ? Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. They did not bless Israel. They were not in the synagogue. They, like those folks in Ephesus, they believed in a rock that fell out of the sky and worshipped a female in heaven. Sound like people today, they're so foolish. Verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in Himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that He might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross." not at the cross, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now, uh, there's another thing we'll probably go into, um, Lord willing, in our next class, how that when he preached the resurrection here in the book of Acts, when those people believed in the resurrection, they became heirs according to the promise. They became children of Abraham by their faith in the resurrection. You see... And so if there was any such thing ever in the Bible as a spiritual Jew, I would suggest that would be them. But these people here did not become spiritual Jews. When, if you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you became saved by the grace of God, you did not become a spiritual Jew. This did not replace Israel. Israel is low am I today? Well, whoever was of faith has died. If the, those people that followed uh, Peter, James, and John, they're resting in the heart of the earth. They're waiting to be resurrected someday as Israelites. There is no Israel today, spiritual or otherwise. He, he didn't say, wherefore remember, after you trusted the Lord, you became a spiritual Jew. He said, wherefore remember that ye being Gentiles in the flesh. I ain't a spiritual Jew. I am a Gentile saved by the grace of God because Paul became a prisoner for me that I might find out that Christ died for me. So remember that. And don't let anybody pull your leg about you being some kind of spiritual Jew. 
and having some kind of favor in this world when the only favor you have <laughs> is whatever grace that the Lord sh uh, sheds forth. And our blessings, of course, are in heavenly places, not here. All right, my, my time's up. I thank you all for your patience tonight. I appreciate you being here.